welcome to another episode of Positive Parenting with Astrology with your host and resident Gemini, Maria Rieger. And I have a real treat for you guys today. We are talking with Tiffany Greist, who is an authenticity coach who helps clients reclaim their authentic selves after toxic conditioning. Uh, one of her areas of specialty is working with clients who have suffered narcissistic abuse as children and as adults. And we're going to talk to Tiffany about that today, how she helps clients and how you can start the process of living your authentic self. So Tiffany, welcome and thanks for coming today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So I, I'm very interested to know your story in coming to be an authenticity coach and kind of what led you and what equipped you to help clients in that way. Yeah. So um, my childhood upbringing wasn't exactly awesome. Um, my mom is a, a narcissist and she leans very heavily towards the victim mentality. Uh, so growing up, I found myself being the peacekeeper, the scapegoat, the walk on eggshells and proactively predict what could come through that door so that I was prepared for anything and everything. Um, I have a younger brother and he was definitely the golden child. So it was my job as my role in the family to be quiet. Um, <laughs> again, keep the peace, not take up too much space, uh, not ever overshadow my brother. And uh, through that, especially with my mom having that, that victim mindset, um, and me wanting to keep the peace and be a people pleaser, there was a lot of instances where, you know, in my adult years, obviously, I realized this looking back that uh, she would intentionally create situations in our lives um, where she could cry wolf and be that victim and, and make us feel bad for existing and make us feel like a burden. And um, in my effort to ease that, and, and pacify that, I found that um, anything I did wasn't going to work, right? And again, trying to get in front of that and being proactive about it. Well, last time I did this, she was upset about it and said, I should have done this. So I'm going to do this next, this time, you know, and then doing that. Nope, that's still not right. And through all of that, and again, creating those situations where, you know, I always, I would like to refer to it as, you know, say somebody turns on an electric stove and they put their hand on the burner and they're like, Hey, my hand is burning. And you're like, well, take your hand off, you know, or let me help you take your hand off. And they're like, but no, it hurts. Like, so take your hand off, you know, or maybe we should do this. Maybe we should do this, but just, um, you know, her wanting to wanting to be in that mm -hmm. situation, in that position, um, again, in my adulthood, realizing that that's how she got attention in her family dynamic was if there was something wrong or, you know, if she was hurt or in danger, that's when she received attention. I don't understand fully or know very much because I'm not connected with my family, um, how that came to be, but realizing that, okay, the more I say, Hey, everybody come here and feel sorry for me. That's how she received love. So creating those situations was just natural to her. Um, and in all of that, as, you know, as a child growing up, I learned that I couldn't trust myself as far as the decisions that I made, um, that I was there on behalf of other people, that I didn't matter, that I wasn't important. And literally I embraced for a very long time, even in through my adulthood, which we'll probably get into that I kind of accepted at some point that my position here on earth literally was just to take the hits for other people because I was so strong. I could recoup. I could, you know, I could soak up all of their energy and, and transmute it and I could make every, everybody better. I was able to, you know, help them see what I could see in them, the empath in me. Um, I could fix everything. And I just kind of accepted like, okay, well, I keep going through all this BS in my life because that's just who I am. And, and I tried to find comfort and peace and like, oh, okay, well, that's because I'm a super strong person and not everybody in this world has these, you know, coping skills or knowledge or, you know, intuition or whatever you want to call it, probably a combination of everything um, to be able to overcome this. And I realized uh, that that was the 
you know, I, like I said, I kind of accepted that mindset and, and it made me numb, but it helped me find a positive in it. <laughs> that was the only way right. that I could do that. And it started to come into fruition because I, in my adult life, started to have people come to me with their problems and, you know, people that I've never met, you know, strangers or in, in my corporate work environment, like employees would come to me and close my office door and just vent. And I found myself always having something that I could not just understand, but I could relate to. Mm -hmm. And that's huge because you can, you know, you can say, oh yes, I, that must be so hard and, you know, have all those empathetic phrases. But when you're able to insert yourself into their lives and say, I get it. And this mm -hmm. is what happened for me. And I feel you and I hear you. That's that validation that people need. And that's when things kind of started to shift for me. Yes, I realized I was put in those situations so that I could help other people. But at the same time, you're healing yourself as you're healing other people as well. So right. Right. That's very powerful because now you can have a positive effect in other people's lives. That's empowering for you. It's confidence boosting, obviously. And that's like when I think of a person who, you know, is a healing facilitator, right? That's what I think of. Or you're able to, you know, kind of put yourself in the shoes of the other person. So yeah, I think um, I have a lot to ask you about, but one thing I want to ask you about now is you mentioned the kind of one of the legacies of that kind of narcissistic abuse, which unfortunately I have a lot in common with you with the uh, narcissist mother. The, the most problematic part of the legacy for me as an adult who had suffered from that as a child was the not trusting my own intuition and not trusting my own decision making. And it was easy for me as a younger adult to delegate my autonomy to other people than to make decisions. But that puts you in a very bad spot because then other people, as I tell parents on my channel all the time, other people are not always going to have or frequently not going to have your best interests at heart. They're going to have their best interest at heart. You have to look out for you. And when you become a parent, you have to look out for your kids. So part of that journey for me was when I became a parent, I saw, wow, I have to radically advocate for my kid. And that also means I have to radically advocate for myself. No more standing back because now it's not just about me. It's about my kid and the injustices I see happening to him. And I'm not going to let that happen. Yeah, but that's that part of that journey is like learning to trust your own intuition again. And unfortunately, that a lot of the times means like no contact with a narcissistic abuser because every time there's contact, they create that mental fog, that mental confusion. They want to keep you on your toes. Like, like you hinted, you know, I want you to perform to make me look good, but not perform too well. And yeah. you have no idea as a child where that middle is. You have no idea. Okay. I need to achieve, but not achieve too much. So I don't know what to do because I get criticized either way. So yeah, so um, before I get too much too much further into it, I'll, most of the parents, I would say, yeah, most of the parents who watch my channel um, are dealing with their own, you know, healing and going through the reparenting process from childhood abuse, childhood trauma, negative conditioning, people pleasing, all that stuff. So what in your experience have been, we talked a little bit about this already, are some of the hallmarks of uh, children who had those backgrounds when they grew up as adults like what ha like what are the hallmarks I guess of that kind of abuse in adults like we talked about the people pleasing and things like that so how do they show up like how does that how does that narcissistic abuse in kids affect the adult child once they grow up and they're independent yeah and and that's a great question because I mean you know we are we are present right and the only only thing we can do is control the future right. um so for me personally uh, the way that that really started to show up for me was outside of continuing to attract other people that I thought that I could help and that I could fix and that I was on this mission to see past the, you know, who they were presenting in the 3D, <laughs> so to speak, and see past that and really just get them to see what I see. Uh, I, I will say both professionally and romantically, I drew in people in my life that were broken, <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that fortunately and unfortunately, fortunately, now that I can channel it properly, um, that I could see what was going on with them. I could understand why. And I knew that I had, that I was equipped 
with the tools and methods and words and all the things to to undo it. Right. Um, so romantically, especially, I mean, alcoholics, physically and mentally, emotionally abusive individuals, because like I said, with my mom, uh, the way that I grew up and knew how to receive love was that, like you said, if I'm performing, if I'm, if I am a benefit to you in some way, if I am soaking up all of that burden, if I'm taking responsibility for your actions, words, thoughts, and behaviors, putting it on me and personalizing it. I'm doing you a favor because I hate to see that you're taking all of that on your own. You know, no, I play a role in this and, oh, maybe I didn't do good enough to help you see, you know, to feel that love or to feel that worth. And maybe it's me projecting onto you and just that whole whirlwind of, you know, self-blame and, and all of that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you name it, any type of abuse you can think of is, is what I brought into Mm -hmm. my life from a romantic standpoint. And then, uh, professionally, my last job in corporate America, which was my final, like I, I, when I was laid off, I was like, I'm done working for people, (laughs) you know, because uh, just that whole, forget the, you know, forget the way that I was treated in that environment. It got to the point where I was like, you know what, I'm done making other people look good. I'm done making the same amount of money as other people on my level, but working 12 times harder, not being recognized for it. And on top of it, the people around me had that mentality of they weren't proud of me. They didn't celebrate. They weren't grateful for the things that I did. Not that I needed the pat on the back, but, an, you know, acknowledgement. Um, and instead it was discounted. Oh, that's just how you are. Oh, that's just what you do. Like, no, I am mm-hmm. exerting myself to go above and beyond because I want to make a difference. And you just get yourself to that point where you're exhausted. You know, mm-hmm. again, back to my childhood, anything that I could do wasn't good enough or it was just expected of me and it was completely yeah. discounted. And I, I was made to feel like just a tool. I wasn't a person. Yeah. I was just a, a pawn in somebody else's game. And, and that's and, a little manipulative when people say, Oh, you can handle this. No problem. You can handle this. And you're like, well, they say I can handle this. I guess I can handle this. Meanwhile, your back is breaking. And sometimes they don't even know what else is going on. I remember having to advocate at work and say, Hey, um, when would you like me to get this done? Because I have this, 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 this. Oh, you have all that stuff? Oh. Or I remember one time having, you know, scheduled appointments all day. And at 1.30, my boss is like, take this too. And I looked at him and I said, when would you like me to take lunch? Oh, you haven't taken lunch yet? He said, no, because you scheduled me with back-to-back appointments all day. Oh, well, take lunch now. It doesn't occur to them. Right. Nobody else is going to advocate for you. Like the old adage, nobody's coming to save you. Like, I hate to be like that. But it's true. Anyway, yeah. so I, I just wanted to point that out real quick that that's actually manipulative. People are like, oh, you can handle this. I remember my mother telling me, oh, but you're a smart person. You can't be manipulated. Oh, lady, everybody can be manipulated. Yeah. You're the smartest person in the room. Yeah, the worst, the worst thing that, that, you know, years ago in my adulthood before I started, you know, my journey was, was a phrase similar to that, right? Oh, you're strong. Mm-hmm. I do not like the word resilience because it sounds exhausting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, and, and a phrase that I like to use now in any kind of relationship that I have is just because I can doesn't mean I should have to. Right. And, and that's something that me, you know, communicating to other people helps put them in that mindset. That's a boundary for me you know, especially right. in romantic relationships, like I'm, I'm embracing my femininity and that toxic, uh, you know, trauma response of being fiercely independent. It doesn't work mm-hmm. for me anymore. And yes, I can do, you know, man things around the house or I can, you know, do whatever, but I'm tired of doing it. Right. <laughs> like, right. Now it's my turn, right? It's my time to shine. It's my turn to ask for help. Right. Uh, it's my turn to raise my hand, to take up space, matter and be, guilt-free about it, you know, and that, right. that is huge. That is completely transformational from where I was. Right. Exactly. Cause it, we're almost like adults who have had our background are almost like addicted to being needed. And I look back on my life and I think, Oh, at this time I didn't, at this point, in this point, in this example, when this happened, I did not have to take on that responsibility. I did not have to do it, but it was like a knee jerk reaction. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. And then I started stopping and thinking, no, I don't want to do this. And I don't have the energy. And I used to, another like big hallmark of this legacy is 
this need to constantly defend yourself and over explain. Well, I can't, I used to say, well, I can't do that. Why can't you go out that night? Because I have X, Y, and blah, blah. And then the person would argue with me and say, well, no, you don't need to do this. Or you can structure like this. Now I say, no, I'm not able to. Why not? I'm not able to. You have plans? I, or I'll just say I have plans. If my plans are staying at home watching Netflix, those are my plans. Yeah. I have plans. Yeah. What are you doing? I have plans. Are you going out? I said, I'm not able to. Right. Ooh, yeah. That's, that's it. Like, like I say, like I'm an attorney, right? By day, I don't litigate though, but I tell people like you're, like you're testifying in court. Oh, a- answer the question you were asked. Don't explain anymore. Right. Are you free? Nope. That's it. You don't have, you're going to want to explain more, but you don't have to. And not only that, it drags you into this discussion that just saps your energy. So you have to just nip it and stop it right away. Yeah. And you have the potential to give, you know, the person on the other side, depending on what their traits are, if they're a toxic individual, you're put, putting yourself in a position where you're giving them almost ammunition to throw back in your face right. Right. now or down the road to make you feel right. bad for having that boundary or for having that priority right. that, you know, superseded whatever their, their stuff is. So yeah, absolutely. And we, um, you know, another thing about, about over explaining, I think is, and it ties what I'm trying to say is it ties hand in hand with that need to be needed. We see our performance and our productivity as a way of validating ourselves. Mm -hmm. So no, I can't do this with you because I'm doing like, but don't worry, I'm still busy over here. Like I'm still, I'm still doing something. I just, you know, and, and that's where a lot of that over explaining comes from. Like, don't worry, I'm not lazy. I I do care. I just, you know, like, right. Right. And that's, yeah. Like the, the term busy people wear as a badge. My sister said to me one day, she goes, I hate that term. She goes, when I ask people how you do it and they say busy, that doesn't answer my question. <laughs> I'm like, you're right, busy, but people could be spitting their wheels and be busy. Like, I, I mean, and I don't, but that's, you bring up a really good point. Is it again, like people with our backgrounds, a lot of the time we determined or learned to determine our worth based on what we could do for other people and based on our accomplishments. And it's look, it's great to like have this sense of pride at your accomplishments. That's great. I, and I love that. And I certainly encourage everybody to strive for what they want to do, find out their passions, their purpose in life, strive for that, take pride in your accomplishments. Absolutely. That's great. And you should be congratulated. However, we're not, you know, worthy based on our accomplishments or worth our, like I tell parents all the time, don't please do not suggest to your children that their worth is tied to their grades, yes. to their academic performance. Okay. Very intelligent. There are very intelligent children that just don't do as well in a traditional school environment. It does not mean they are not smart, right. or that they cannot, you know, achieve some measure of success for themselves in a different environment. So, right, those are all really, really good points. I live in a really hyper competitive area outside of Washington, Washington D.C., and I see the parents a lot of times pushing the kids to perform and getting them tutors to get in the right schools and all these things, and um. You know, I and I wonder about the kids' self-esteem and what the the message that they're receiving, right? So all that's all important stuff to keep in mind for sure. Yeah, I'd I'd actually like to share an example of of Please. something like that. Uh, when my I was eight, when my parents separated, and I think ten when it, the divorce was final, and you know, my mom being that oh poor me mentality. Um, instead of getting what I referred to as a child as a real job, she actually got a bunch of part-time minimum wage jobs, not because she was underqualified for anything, but because if it meant that she was working from sun up to sun down and still not making any money and, oh, you poor thing. And you have two kids and you're on your own now. And like, that doesn't impress me. You know, I don't understand how you're away from the home and you're so busy and then you get home and then you're tired and exhausted. You're completely neglecting us and we still can't eat, but you get all these, oh my poor you. And I don't, how do you wow. do it? And I'm like, how does she do what? <laughs> like she's, she's just, you know, out there so that, because yeah. that's what she fed off of. Right. And for me, uh, I've never, I've never liked the nine to five, never liked the nine to five. Um, and again, when I, when I got laid off, I was like, you know what, I'm done. Like, I'm going to make my own schedule and everything I do is based on how can I work less and make more so that I can live the lifestyle that I want to live. And it's not lavish and and bougie or anything. I just want to be comfortable 
and I sure. want to make a difference. And yeah, growing up after that and saying, okay, so if you're busting your butt out there in the world, one, you still don't have money, right? That was a, that was something that was ingrained to me. Like no matter how hard you work, you're still going to struggle and you're struggling because you're working so hard. And now in this life, that hustle mentality is actually the most, like, it's not attractive to me at all. Right. I am right. not impressed by it. I actually like think some kind of way, not, not in a judgy way, but like, it takes me back and like, okay, well, here you are thinking the busier you are, the more valuable you are. And that that's not it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it saddens me to see that you think that. Um, but also again, and me personally, putting myself in that mentality, hustle, 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 and still don't make any money. Why? Why? Yeah. I'd rather right. flow and have things come to me because I'm not putting up that resistance and I'm more surrendering right. and I'm being more authentic to myself. And that thing is that being that way is naturally going to magnetize what I'm looking for. Anyways, I don't have to get out there and, and push myself like that because I'm actually pushing what I want away. You know, I'm mm -hmm. saying, I don't trust the universe mm -hmm. or whatever you want to say. Right. You know, I don't trust myself and my decisions and, you know, my energy of who, who I am um, to just be in that moment and to be that way for things to come to me. I need to go out there and get it. No, like it literally makes me nauseous. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's a good point. Uh, it, it's, it's right. I mean, I certainly celebrate people who have a passion and, and in, in finding their purpose and driven and are working hard on that. And it brings them joy and fulfillment versus I'm just going to fill the time up and spin my wheels so I can appear busy, but they're not happy and not fulfilled. And right. that's something I, like I see more parents imparting to their kids, this idea of, Hey, you can structure your life how you like, you don't have to get a nine to five job. You don't have to sit behind a desk. You don't have to even work for somebody else. Shoot, I mean, like, what if when my son was younger and we watched more YouTubers? Shoot, some of our favorite YouTubers were earning a million dollars in revenue and they're like early to mid 20s. Fantastic. That's great. <laughs> if you're having fun and you like it, do it. And it's making money for you. And I see you're buying your parents a home. Fantastic. Like, that's one of the, I mean, we can sit here and lament like the age of technology and smartphones. And yeah, there's a lot of negative th stuff I could say about it. But one thing is that it's it's really, you know, seem to give more people more opportunities in how they're structuring their lives, whether it's remote work or, like you said, not having this nine to five job, doing your own job, your own company or or even just doing the nine to five grind to save up enough money to not have to work right to retire in your 30s and 40s and then not have to work a formal job, but instead maybe do other activities you find fulfilling, volunteering, traveling. Uh, raising kids, whatever that is, right? So, so um, yeah, all good stuff. And so I want to talk to you more about that living authentically. Um, and especially you as an authenticity coach, how you you help your clients with that, because what I find when I talk to parents is they've had to subjugate, you know, their authenticity as kids due to, for example, narcissistic abuse. For so long, a lot of them tell me, I'm not even sure what I like to do. I'm not even sure what my values are or what my preferences are, right? And that's where like I one of the things I do is is astrology and birth chart readings and the birth chart is a blueprint of an individual's energy and that can help them start that journey. It's one of the things that I like to use with people to start that journey of well, here's your energy expression does this resonate with you, right? So so how do you help clients start that process of kind of reclaiming and and living their authenticity? So um, I do need to say, obviously, everybody's journey is different, right? Sure. So it always starts with, um, I mean, my, my main message, right, is authenticity and alignment. Well, what does that look like for you, for one, which, like you said, is so hard because we've never been allowed to have that voice, to mm -hmm. have that opinion, or even a self-identity, <laughs> you know, we're always, we're, yeah. we're this, this piece of flesh that is, is out there for other people. Um, so defining what that looks like for them, but I would say before that, initially the relationship starts with, um, how do you feel right now? How are things, what is going on in your life? How do you feel? Um, how are you showing up in, in whatever capacity for yourself or your job or whatever it is that feels icky, 
<laughs> you know, what, what doesn't feel right? Because that helps people realize the first things to cut out. And it's really, really encouraging for, you know, getting those small wins up front. Uh, I do obviously connect with my clients and, and understand, especially that relatability piece that we talked about, understand why, you know, what happened in your past, obviously, um, how does that show up similar to the framework of our conversation, right? What happened? How is it happening? You know, how is it showing up for you as an adult and what do you need to change? And that I will, I will be completely honest, takes a very large chunk of our time together. That all has to be laid out because it's a matter of self-reflection. There's a process of, of self-forgiveness, of understanding it's not your fault, of having to separate yourself and your identity from other individuals' personalities, their traits, their failures, their shortcomings, and how it means nothing about you or your worth. Having that aha moment of all this stuff in my life right now is stuff that I brought in. It's stuff that I mm -hmm. am accepting. It's stuff mm -hmm. that I have been conditioned to feel comfortable with and literally just settle. Right. Uh, like, like I mentioned where I was just numb and I was right. just like, Hey, I guess I'm just here to, you know, get kicked in the face all the time because I right. can always stand back up and pick up the right. pieces by myself and who else right. can I help? Um, but to have that, okay, I do have control here because I allowed this and realizing that because you allowed that, it also means that you have the power to cut that out of your life. Right. And then I would say the next step within that is building that self-trust, is building that self-worth, is understanding that whatever decisions that you make, if you can if you can get yourself in that position of surrender, which was something that was so hard for me, and I'm sure you right. can relate to the more yes. control you have, that's yes. your safety blanket, that's your wall, mm -hmm. that's your protection. Uh, but the more that you can learn to just let go mm -hmm. uh, and not, not uh, surrender in a way of like, all right, whatever, you know, this is just what it is, but, but be like, you know what, I'm releasing any expectations. I am putting trust out there in myself and in something greater. That is, if I can understand and fully grasp the concept and embrace the mindset of, uh, this is what I say a lot, um, like on, on my podcast, is uh, your your only job is you, right? I say self-employed and I don't mean entrepreneur. Your only freaking job is you. So if you can cut out all the stuff from your life and realize if you can focus on being present, if you can identify those things, like you said, those values that you mm -hmm. never had a chance to identify. I used to hate the question, you know, what do you like yeah. to do for fun? <laughs> I'm allowed to have fun. Like what? I know. I, I don't know. And then if you want to say something, you're like, no, but I feel bad. Like I'm not allowed to have yeah. fun, I'm allowed to feel happy. And you just like go on the yeah. shell. Like, what do you mean? Oh, I like to draw. I'm sorry though. Like, yeah, I, it's, you're it's, and it's like, it's, you feel uncomfortable when you're taking time for yourself. You, you, all of a sudden you have anxiety and it's like, well, I should be doing something. I should be doing yeah. something. It took me a long time to actually feel comfortable just doing nothing. Yeah. Just being like, like I'm going to sit here and just be at peace, you know, light a candle and just be at peace or read a book by myself. Like it took me a long time to be, to be able to do that comfortably. And now I, I think, how could I? Why was I like that? How could I have not done this? Right? It takes yeah. a, it's a process for sure. And you do have to go back. Like when you're in mm -hmm. that moment, in the in the uh, transformative process, and you're like, okay, what what do you want life to look like? What does light you up? What does make you happy? Breaking down those layers first, and being able to find an answer to that question right. usually happens when you do go back into your childhood. What did you do back then that brought you joy and that you were shot down? You know, because that, that's what happens. And right. that's why we don't have those answers because we right. stuck down because we were always challenged on it. So a lot of the times, and yes, obviously, you know, children and adults, we have different responsibilities and things like that and motivation, but that's a good place to start. Because remember when you thought you were allowed to have fun and when you thought that it was okay to have an opinion and to get excited about something, you were taught it was not okay, but guess what? You're an adult now. 
And right. going back to that reparenting, it's time to tell yourself, right. hey, I, I call myself Tiny Tiff. Hey, Tiny Tiff, you know, this is this is something awesome. that you enjoy. And this is something, there's no reason, there's no one around here to tell me that I can't do that. Right. You're in charge now. You are the parent now. You are the adult now. Right. And you are safe. And it is right. okay. Um, right. And then, uh, you know, the next phase in, in my process after identifying what those things are is, you know, the, the phrase of, uh, you know, who you are at the core, what is the phrase? It's like the Michelangelo statue thing that they say, where he, he looked at the piece of marble and he just right. chipped away the things that weren't him. That's when you really take that, that right. and break it down. Yeah. Who do you want to be? Now, what are all the things about you that you think about yourself, that you feel about yourself, other people's right. stories and versions of you that you've absorbed and personalized and identified with that do not belong in your life? Right. So what's stopping you from being that person? Identifying all of that and then going into, okay, now how can we start interjecting these things that bring you joy into your life? Um, me on my healing journey, I... I started and I just had a really in-depth conversation with a friend about this yesterday. You think, okay, well, if, if I'm authentic and I'm aligned, you picture like Buddhist monks that are always just meditating and like, oh, Rusa and everything's love and light. And, and I can't be in a bad mood and I can't be yeah. angry. And if I have negative energy, yes, if you are vibing negatively, you're going to bring that inside. But it's not all about that. It's right. about getting mad. Are you mad? then that that's how you feel. Yeah. Right? You know, that yeah. is an authentic feeling. That is who you are and breathe the heck out of it and turn that pain into power. You right. know, allow yourself to sit in that crap. It doesn't right. always have to be like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. You're not right. having to be the peacemaker right. yourself anymore. <laughs> Let yeah. that out. <laughs> and that's, you know, that can even pretending to be like, I'll say nice for lack of a better word. And suppressing the anger actually is also, no, we know now, damaging to your physical health. Like if if people who read like Gabor Mate and Bessel van der Kolk's, like the body keeps the score, um, you know, both said suppressing anger is linked to a whole host of physical, neurological, you know, um, and immune compromised disorders. And Gabor Mate points that out. He would say uh, people who were diagnosed with certain neurological disorders, um, they they were almost like described to be too nice by the medical practitioners because they would never say so the anger not only is it healthy to feel the anger and admit that you are angry but you know that's the point is not only is it as okay to do that it is healthy to do that now anger can be destructive so we're not talking about that but it's recognizing that you are angry and allowing yourself to just feel that and sit with that is permitted but also healthy and I, I think with similar upbringings to ours too, when you're in that point of your healing journey, um, I mean, I guess the best example of what I like to talk about is there's a difference between being assertive and aggressive. Mm -hmm. And when we say or think or feel a certain way, we immediately go to that person that hurt us because they were that way all the time. They are not you. The way they expressed those feelings was unhealthy and it was damaging to you. However, expressing those feelings, like you said, it is so important because if you don't, and this is a, a little tool too, if you don't express those emotions, yes, they do get trapped in your body. So you have had an experience mm -hmm. that trauma is trapped somewhere. 90% of the time it's in your hips, right? Right. Physically. Right. You can right. Feel that in your body. So as an adult, you go through a similar experience and you start to feel a ping somewhere mm -hmm. that is just rehashing and, you know, cutting that trauma wound back up in your body. Pay attention. This is something that isn't right, that this is something that you still have some work to do. Right. Um, and letting that out, it you're almost desensitized, but in a healthy way to mm -hmm. those triggers moving forward because you've right. released that trauma and that ick energy is allowed to flow right. through your body. You're not in pain, not in dis-ease. You're not exhausted. Um, all of those things, because you, you've given your body, I, you know, I always, I always follow up like my woo-woo stuff with like, it's science, you know, it's yeah. all science. True, so exactly. If, if you have a blocked PVC pipe, obviously the water's not getting through, right? What do you expect? Eventually it's going to burst. When there's that pressure, it's going to expand. There's going to be tension there. 
same thing with your body. You let that go and it, and it flows. So why would you, you know, choose to hold on to all of that? Right. Especially because right. it's not, it's right. not your <laughs> Right. Somebody else is doing somebody else's issues. They're trauma. Right. They're not responsible for yeah. That. Talk about that kind of trauma. Around. That's right. You know, uh, spread through generations until somebody decides we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, I, I like to talk about what you just talked about in the context of like having to control the environment, because that is something I find in myself. That was my experience too. Other parents with similar backgrounds, they feel like they have to control everything. If they don't, bad things will happen. Well, it's exhausting. Number one, it's going to just, you know, burn you out and you can't control everything anyway. And I found out, much as you said, Tiffany, I found out that when I started practicing that, you know what, I don't have control over this. I am letting this go. And whatever the outcome is, I'll be fine with it and I will deal with it. And when I did that process, like 90% of the time, things just resolved naturally without me having to get involved. And I was like, wow, that actually works. So I started to do that more often. Now it's easy to fall back in the old patterns. Oh, I need to go fix this or this is going to happen. I can see this about to happen because we're so attuned to look for threats in the environment, right? But so I have to constantly remind myself of doing that. But you can get in a habit where you're like, okay, I can't control this. And if there's something I need to address here, I will address it for me or my family, my kids, but I can't control this entire situation. I can't control what other people do. I can't control their responses, right? I tell that to the parents all the time. You can't control your kid's behavior, right? It's tough. I mean, you can try, but it's tough, but you can control your responses. And if like you're sending your kid off to school, your kid's in a bad mood, you don't have control over their moods, but you have control over yours and you can be okay with, your side of the interaction before like you drop them at school and don't see them for a while, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I, yeah, that need very, to control is strong. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a very difficult, um, I, I think I just posted about this yesterday, you know, it's that, that frustrating, lonely, terrible, yeah. awful part of the healing process that right. nobody talks about. So for anybody that's watching us, Maria, I don't want anybody to be like, oh, well, that's easy for you to say, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I'll be fine with whatever happens, da, 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 you know, right. sure, yeah. And yeah, sure, we were at first. No, we absolutely sure. were not. <laughs> Our subconscious no. was freaking out. No. And, you know, telling us all, wait, wait, this, you know, you're not safe. You can't do this. You have right. to, be you have to and, be evolved. Right. Yeah. And I, I never, um, and I know you don't either. I never want to, you know, even come close to trying to convey right. that message of just like, oh, whatever happens. Ha like, no. Yeah. It's so very girl, hard like, to it do. Yeah. Process. And that's yeah. why working with somebody that has been through that stuff and having an outlet and things to kind of put you back in check or be like, I'm struggling with this for someone to really, that has gone through those experiences to be like, I get it. It's hard. And this is what we're going to do. And what we're going to do right now is be okay with the fact that that's how you feel right now. Right. <laughs> because right. So exactly. We're going to sit and with it's fine. It. it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's a, pro it's a long process. I find it's helpful to like have a list of activities and if you start to get mired in, oh my God, what if in that like letting go process, um, uh, it's helpful to kind of go to your, some activities, either, you know, you can feel good about being productive or you get your body in motion or fun activities that may take your mind off of the, I need to control this part of fun. I mean, so you have to, like you said, you have to be proactive about that stuff because you also don't want to be sitting dwelling, well, what's going to happen? If I'm not involved, what's yeah. going to happen? You have to be proactive about yeah. Let me replace this kind of uh, problematic conditioning with other things. And that's right. a long process. And But you can get there. I mean, people can get there, but it is a journey. It's like I tell parents, I'm like, I, you may not wake up one day and be like, oh, that's it. I'm perfectly healed. This is never going to bother me again. That's not how it works. <laughs> so, but you can get to a point you can get to a place where you feel really good and be like, you know what? I'm a good human. I'm a good mom. And I feel pretty good about my life and my parenting and my healing right now. You know, and you can get to that place. Yeah. Exactly. And it is about mindfulness when you catch yourself, right. Right. You know, in that moment, that's a moment to celebrate, even if it doesn't right. feel good because you caught yourself, you're waking up, you know, right. And that's where it starts. Right, exactly. You're breaking those patterns. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a long process. I'm very happy that we have coaches like you to help people because it, you, we need help. It's like, it's a hard thing to do 
on your own and it's good to get the validation uh, that you're, you know, handling it in a, in a healthy way, an emotionally healthy way, right, for yourself. Um, I want to point out, too, to viewers uh, how important authentic the authenticity part of this healing journey is, because as Gabor Mate says in, I think almost, he mentions this in most of his books, certainly his most recent one on healing in a toxic culture, that when children um, are confronted or with authenticity and attachment being in conflict, they always choose attachment because kids have to attach either to the caregiver or maybe to peers if the caregiver is not available. So attachment wins every time if the two are in conflict. So and that's you know heartbreaking because that means they're suppressing their authentic selves. But also um, I wanna say something positive about that is that if we can give our kids both that's fantastic. If they don't have to choose between the two, they can attach to caregivers, have this healthy attachment, and also feel safe about being authentic. That's huge. And that's, I mean, you're giving your kids a real gift if, you, if you're able to do that. So, but that's how important authenticity coaching is, um, is that, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're essentially giving yourself permission to be your authentic self, but all also in the context of healthy attachment. Yeah. 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 My, my son is 22 now and I've oh, wow. been a single mom my whole life. Yeah. And the way that I raised him was he had two rules. If you're happy and if you're safe, I don't care what you do. Right. And through his upbringing, um, I mean, he's, he's incredibly responsible. He's cordial, he's professional, he's very successful already in, in his job. And I mean, like, and that's not because he's my son. <laughs> he's like, he's an amazing human being. And, uh, you know, having given him those two rules, that to me, from a parent standpoint, was providing him with the tools and the guidance and that filter without telling him what to do. It allowed him to put himself in positions where if he had this, you know, urge to do something or a decision to make, if he was able to put it through, am I happy? Yes. Am I safe? Yes. Then I can do. It. Yeah, there you go. And, Perfect. And that was early, early conditioning with him because then it allowed him to trust his own decisions. It wasn't, is mom happy? Am I going to mm -hmm. get in trouble? Um, am I going to hurt somebody's feelings? I mean, all of those are important, right? But if you put them through those two filters, that allowed him to be authentic right. with himself. Right. So those Perfect. are the only two things that matter in yeah. your life, right? And right. Uh, with that, you know, as he's grown, you know, he'll, he'll still come to me with decisions and I'm devil's advocate. I will never tell him what to do. Never, right. ever tell him what to do. Uh, you know, for example, when he turned 18, we were talking about credit and, and he hates the concept of credit and interest and all of that. But I mean, welcome to adulthood, brother. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we've had conversations like that about money and, and creating his future stuff. I, for one, never had the right. to have. Um, but I would just lay things out, whether he liked to hear the, you know, the reality of stuff like that or not, this is how it is. He hates the concept of car insurance. Why do I have to have car insurance? One, it's a lot. Two, right. if you don't, then blah, blah, blah. You know, the whole, the whole we all right. hate right. right? But we all hate insurance. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right? um, but, you know, having those conversations and, uh, you know, me, again, instilling and encouraging that trust in his own self and his own decisions. Right. I it's it's only my job to give him the facts. It's right. my job to give him the experiences, the good and the bad that I've had. That's it. At that point, he knows go make a decision. But also right. at that point, he knows if the decision that you made was the wrong one or backfired right. or whatever. Congratulations on your life experience and your life right. lesson. I'm still your mother and we're gonna get you out of this. Of course. And here's yeah. how. I'm not doing it for you. Here's how. But I'll guide uh, you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, for him to know, uh, going back to that, whatever happens, I know I'm going to be okay. It's safe to make decisions. Just make sure that you take some time to process it before you act. Don't be impulsive. Don't be, you know, whatever. Go make that decision and know that whatever happens, whatever you decide, it has nothing to do with you. That's what you thought was the best thing at the time. You were being authentic. You were trusting yourself. Right. I encourage it backfired. Oh, well, 
What's plan B? Let's figure it out. And right. to encourage, you're not alone in that. You don't have right. to figure it out yourself. It is okay to come back and, you know, with your tail between your legs and be like, hey, I right. screwed up. Like, that's right. okay. You screwed up. Yeah. What did we learn? And how can we change this moving forward? Ask for help. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. I love it. Cause that's, that's, yeah. I mean, that's um, leading and guiding and the word discipline, you know, we talk in the parenting context, discipline has roots in the word to guide, to lead. It's not about punishing. It's about here, I'll guide you. Like you said, you come to me with questions and I can help you with it. Not going to tell you what to do. I can tell you my experience with something. I can tell you what worked or may not have worked for me. And also, um, you know, you can, I love this idea about decision making uh, that I, I, one of my business law classes I took, um, the professor said, and this really resonated with me, you know, you can make a good decision based on the facts data you have. It can be a good decision, but may have a bad outcome. That can happen. Yep. Maybe the decision was sound, but maybe you just didn't have all the facts or maybe some other intervening event happened and you had no control over, talk about control, right? That can happen too. Doesn't mean it was a bad decision. Doesn't mean you necessarily made a mistake. Sometimes that happens. So I think something to keep in mind. Yeah, when guiding kids, like, yeah, so many moms I talk to have that, um, that, you know, pension for, I need to, you know, control what's going on here, right? As opposed to leading and guiding and helping, right? I, they are afraid their kids are gonna make mistakes or God forbid, like a bad grade in a class. But, you know, kids need to, yeah, learn to be independent. Well, number one, because it's confidence boosting. If you constantly have other people handling everything for you, you know, your self-confidence takes a, takes a dive. So it's confidence boosting and also empowering so that they can, that they, you know, giving them the, the encouragement that they can handle things. They're going to be able to handle things as an adult, right? So all stuff, important stuff to point out for sure. Right. Sure. Right. And it's, it's a challenge too, I will say, um, coming from a, an upbringing, you know, mm -hmm. such as ours to not want to just wrap the kid in bubble wrap and be mm -hmm. like, I was yep. through the ringer as a child. So I'm going to do everything that I can to protect you. And I'm going to overcompensate for the things that happen. Um, it's, it's difficult to find that balance. Right. As far as so you don't want to turn into, you know, the human being that raised you, right? You don't right. want to continue that cycle, but you don't want to go to the opposite extreme and not give them any experiences at all right. because it's just as toxic and damaging as it is to, right. you know, not allow them to live their own lives and to live it for them. But I think there's um, a tendency in parents that have had that type of upbringing going back to that need to be needed. And that codependency mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. of it, that as long as I am there to continue to not just catch you when you fall, but stand in front of you so that you don't, right. then you're not going to leave me and you're going to need right. me. And right. it's not a malicious mentality, but if, if there's people out there that might think like, oh, is that me? Sit with that for a minute mm -hmm. because you're one, you're not doing your children any favors Two, I totally get where that comes from. And, and I, I totally do. Like, I don't, I don't yeah, know. I totally do too. <laughs> and yeah. It, it's justified. It's normal. Yeah. But take a step back and think about, are you helping your child or are you hurting your child? And right. is it about your need to be needed and you, you having that attachment to them? Um, or is this about, you know what, I'm confident in my parenting mm -hmm. and because I don't want my child to have those experiences, I'm not going to treat him negatively mm -hmm. i'm not going to stifle him and stunt his growth i'm going to find that middle ground to give him the things that i did that middle. right right exactly yeah that's yeah that's um yeah that is tough uh it's tough as a mom and it's tough to think about with the kids i mean this is you've already experienced this your kid growing up and leaving the household so it's it's helpful to think about i think for parents life after that like when your kids you know, are, are going to be grown up in a few years and leave the household. Like, how do you want your life to look? Maybe that means a little bit more freedom in your schedule, a little more travel. Like those are my plans. Like I'm kind of, while I'm very bittersweet about the fact that in a few years, my, you know, my son will go off to college and uh, leave the home. I'm also excited thinking about, well, I can travel more often. I can live in a different place. I have a little bit more freedom, my schedule, you know, things like this. So I'm excited about thinking about structuring my life like post those years, right? After those years. So it's helpful to think about that, what you can be excited about at that next stage. And like you said, 
doesn't mean you're not going to have contact. They're still going to, you know, young adults still need a lot of support with, you know, calling, you know, I have cousins that their adult kids still call them with questions and guidance about mortgages and other things. <laughs> so, you know, you're still going to have that close relationship, but it'll be different. But it's also going to be gratifying to see these you know, kids grow up into these independent adults, like you said, Tiffany, like you, that and they were able to get the consistent caretaking and healthy caretaking that we did not get as kids. Yeah. So that's all very gratifying. So we should be, if you're in that journey, you should be uh, proud of yourself and pat yourself on the back a little bit because it is not easy. As, uh, you know, Bessel van der Kolk also said in his book, uh, adults who as children um, suffered that kind of caretaker abuse and have those like the complex PTSD, it takes them more energy to deal with the vicissitudes of life a lot of time than it takes other adults that did not have that, uh, you know, those circumstances. So, so it may take us, you know, a little bit more effort to do certain things and we may need a little bit more rest sometimes. That is okay. You absolutely have permission to do that. So thank you, Tiffany. This is all really, really good stuff. Before we start to close up, I want to make sure and ask if you have anything else that you want listeners to know, especially like if somebody who is just starting the process of, of this healing process and reclaiming their authenticity, anything else that you would like to tell them? Yeah, um, just a, a couple of key points that I like to always throw in um, and things like this is one, that moment, whether it's with a parent, a relationship, a boss, that moment where you have that, it's, it's the aha moment, right? When you look around and you're like, what is this my life? <laughs> like, what happened? Because that's the nature of abuse, oh right? Like they push yeah. you and then they pull you and like, you don't realize that it's happening to you, especially as a child. Like that was your parent. That's all you knew. Uh, but that moment when you have that, I mean, I, I can only say it in the face. <laughs> yeah. Know? Like, what just happened? That right there, hold on to that. Yeah. That moment means that you're ready to break away, to step, you know, step out of it and start making a change. With that being said, that is the hardest, most pivotal, pivotal, challenging moment that you will probably ever face in your life. Because all you know is that toxicity, that mm -hmm. abuse, that codependency, that need to be needed, everything that we've talked about, that's all that you know. And you literally, when you take that first step, you will feel completely empty, completely lost, like your life has passed you by, stuck, right? You're going to struggle with the unworthiness. You're going to struggle with the, where the heck do I start? All of these things. And again, I'm not one to sugarcoat this healing journey because I want to be, I'm raw, I'm authentic. You know, I want to be, put it out there and set those expectations for people. And that's a lot of things that people fear, which is why they stay in those relationships. Right. So that's, that's my point. When I say, when you have that aha moment, sit in that discomfort, know those feelings are okay they're normal, they're on purpose, and they're going mm -hmm. to happen. So when you have those feelings, choose your heart. I know it seems easier. And that's when you're like, Oh, well, but this is what I know, and I can handle it. And at least I know what to expect. And you're going to want to go back or stay in that. Because it seems easier. Like I get emotional when I talk about this, because it's all you know. Mm -hmm. But that is not okay. That aha moment right there, you need to take that and you need to push and again, choose your heart because it, it'll take years, but it's so worth it. And if you feel like you've given up your life to other people and you've wasted all this time, imagine what the rest of your life is going to look like. Right. So, so do not go back. When you have that moment, find someone to talk to because right. they will help you. They will hold your hand. They will help pick you up and dust you off and remind you that it's okay, it's gonna be rocky, but you are not alone. Right. So that is one thing that that I I say that aha moment is everything, right. everything. Right. Uh, the other thing that I like to stress is giving yourself permission. Our whole lives, we had to bounce things off of other people, predict other people's reactions, how it's gonna make them feel, blah, blah, blah. We're always looking externally for that permission 
to do something, to say something, to feel something, to be something. Give yourself that permission. If you are starting this journey, if you are on the journey, continue to remind yourself every time that you feel that conditioning coming back up where, oh, you know, I'm taking from other people by Mm -hmm. giving to myself or by being assertive, I'm being a jerk, you know, hurting other people. And I don't want to hurt people. All of that's like, give yourself permission to take this journey and to be yourself. It's that word just fuels me. (laughs) Oh, yeah. 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 And, and you go back and you have that conversation with, with your younger self when right. you're in those moments, you know, right. you, this is what you want to do. This is okay. Are you happy? And are you safe? Right. right. Those are, okay. yeah, those are, wow. Those are words to live by. Are you happy? And are you safe? That, yeah, really, that's a really good, just a check-in with yourself. Yeah. yeah just a check-in with yourself for sure. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I would say then also the Last thing that I like to stress, which it might sound obvious, people have probably heard it a hundred gajillion times, but it's so true. And that's why it continues to come up is to remember this is not your fault. Yeah. This is not your fault. It is natural for us, Mm -hmm. especially as empaths, especially being intuitive and everything that we are to take some ownership of it. Yes. Did we allow it? Absolutely. Does that mean Mm -hmm. that you are a, a, crappy human being absolutely not right you've been through some stuff it's all you knew whatever uh but it is not your fault these things happened for you they didn't happen to you and that is as simple as a mindset shift it is as simple as a mindset shift if you couldn't fix that person good it wasn't your job Mm -hmm. now stop giving them energy you've given so much of yourself to this other person your time your health your sanity everything to this person you have it in you now just turn it in towards yourself. Exactly. This is not, this is not yeah. on, it's not on you. Right. Uh, and you'll, yeah. And you can see how much more energy you have when you make that shift yeah. in mindset for sure. Yeah. And it's not, it's not selfish. You know, I, no. yeah. in, in working with my own coaches, I had a coach ask me and, and this has stuck with me forever. Because uh, self-care, self-love, I heard my whole upbringing, anytime I wanted something even a natural need, like, mom, I'm thirsty. You're so selfish. You're so self-centered. We're out here doing this. And now you want to thirsty, man. (laughs) Yeah. Can you imagine that? I just, yeah. I I got called selfish all the time because I was an introvert in a house full of extroverts and I needed alone time in my room. And I was called selfish and antisocial all the time. But it was, I I know, I didn't understand at the time why I needed that time. Now I do. I need the time to recharge after a day of school. I need to be right. with myself. Like, do I right. do it myself? I don't want to have to interact. I need to, it wasn't about other people. It was about my need to recharge. But right. I was, yeah, same thing. And I was like, well, I'm selfish. So I'm taking time for myself. Or I yeah. should want to just be talking with the family the whole time. You know, so yeah, it's important stuff to remember. Yeah, and, and, and my coach asked me, what is... Who is somebody in my life that is selfish in a healthy way? And that to me was like, there's a good selfish? Yeah. Holy cow. So that that set me back. So I challenge everybody to find that one person in their life. And I guarantee it's going to be somebody that stands in their power and that knows what they want. And they vocalize those things and they don't give a crap, you know, what other people think or say. And it's not because it's rude and they don't care about other people. It's because they care about themselves more. Mm -hmm. Think about that person and then how they act and the things that they do that, that are a good kind of selfish. Oh, so-and-so goes to the gym all the time you know, and she, she doesn't schedule appointments between 12 and two. She doesn't give a crap because Mm -hmm. 12 and two is her precious time. And that might be seen as selfish when we come from, you know, that, that damaging mindset or damaged mindset. But you know, at the same time, like good on her. I wish I, I had the power to tell people I wasn't available all the time. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Guess what? <laughs> you you know? can't tell people that. In fact, I do that. Yeah. I schedule my gym time and I'm like, sorry, I'm at, I'm at the gym. I'm not available that time. Yeah. Because my so the, those, health is important. Yeah. So exactly. yeah, for sure. And those, those triggers that you see in other people that you're like, man, you know, if, if mm-hmm. it makes you feel something, yeah. that means you got to do something. One exactly. Way or exactly. Oh man. I tell parents that all the time. Like if you're triggered by your kid's 
behavior, like maybe they're having big emotions, which is developmentally normal for where they are. If you're triggered by that, that's your issue. It's not the kid's issue. It's your issue to deal with, right? And help, you know, help the kids regulate. And they do that by co-regulating with the parents when they're younger, right? So the parent has to learn to self-regulate and then everything else will fall into place, right? For sure, for sure. Oh my gosh, Tiffany, this is such a good stuff. Thank you so much. Very excited to have you on. Very excited to talk about uh, how you can help you know clients gain their authenticity, regain their authenticity. Uh, cause, cause I, I, I love seeing people just like structure their own lives, how they want. Right. I love that. Before I forget, where can viewers connect with you and how can they book your services? I am on Facebook. That's, I would say is okay. my primary way to reach out to me. I love me a DM. Um, but I, I have a website, which is intuitiveintrospection.com. Um, I'll send you my link that will have all the ways to contact me as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can put that in the notes, but definitely reach out to me on Facebook. Um, join me on Facebook. I, I love to just, my whole purpose on there is to inspire and being the intuitive that I am. I know if I'm feeling something or going through, through something, sure. chances are as the collective is as well. Yes. Um, it's very important for me to be authentic and vulnerable and, you know, communicate and things like that, because I know it's not just me. So if nothing else right. to, to get that inspiration, that boost, or just that feeling of, Hey, you know what? It's not just me. <laughs> you know, no, I, I, definitely. And I can tell you from planetary shifts, we have a full moon in Pisces tonight around 9 PM Eastern there. It's a super moon too. So that means the moon is close to the earth. So emotions are heightened. Emotions are enhanced. People are going to be feeling very emotional. I, like you said, that, you know, the collective will be feeling that. Not just you, not just me, everybody. <laughs> Your website is intuitiveintrospection.com. Is that right? Yes. Fantastic. And people can book like one-on-one -on -one sessions with you. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and uh, talking with us about healing from narcissistic abuse and also living authentically. All really important stuff. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Maria.